Hey, how YouTube does that sometimes. Does funny things. Because, like, I tried to make the video link, but then the video link was cut off. So I tried to expand the thing and then opening the video does weird things like that. YouTube's just been acting all weird for me as of late. And I don't know why that is. Why Why you like this? Why you like this? Why you gotta, why you gotta do me dirty like that? That took a while. The loading. It's always the loading. Of course, this thing is messed up. Why would it not be? There you go. I don't know. My, my YouTube just been being weird for the last little while. Okay, let me just fix this a second. Because it just frame drop and then immediate like... Okay, there you go. Like the, I had a small frame drop, and like a little, bit of, a little bit of lag, and then the camera all fell out of sync. But anyway, <clears throat> hello and welcome to the streaming person reads the Gospel of Mark. And even though it is Good Friday today, if you guys went to a Good Friday service of some kind, I just listened to one. <laughs> Cause I don't get out much. Oof, just how it be sometimes, especially at my age. But hope you guys are having a good Friday. And today, even with even with that said, though, we're just gonna do a relatively normal read. We're gonna read one chapter from the Gospel of Mark. We're gonna read chapter seven. Let's we'll just keep it a shorter stream today. Also because my throat is a little bit like, oh. so I don't want to overstrain it. I don't want to risk giving myself a sore throat if that makes sense. So today we're reading Mark chapter 7. I'll be using the New International Version or NIV. I'll give you guys a quick minute to flip there as I start us off with a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we we thank you for this day and we thank you for that, all that you have done in giving us the Lord Jesus Christ to pay, to pay remissions for our sins through his death on a cross. And that through his blood that we have been made righteous with you. And I just pray that as we read through the Gospel of Mark today, that you would continue to show us who you are and to 
inspire us how to be faithful followers and how to trust in you. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so uh, Mark chapter 7. Uh, Mark chapter 7 begins a couple of discourses. Well, not really. He has like one section of it is about like Jesus giving a couple of discourses. A couple of things that Jesus said basically is what Mark is recording. As well as a couple more events of Jesus healing a couple people. <clears throat> so here we go. Chapter 7. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled or unwashed. Uh, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as washing cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? I can find it closer. <clears throat> Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. For it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Jesus continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their parents are to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what he would have given to help his father or mother is Corbin, Corbin meaning devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen up. L uh, sorry, listen up, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them, but rather it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After Jesus said these things, sorry, after Jesus said these things, he left the crowd and entered the house. His disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? Jesus asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can really defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared that all food is clean. Jesus went on, What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, slander, envy, arrogance, and folly come. All of these evils come from inside, and that defiles a person. Verse 24. So Jesus left that place and went to the village, sorry, to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he couldn't keep his presence a secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at Jesus' feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all, they, all that they want, Jesus told her, for it isn't right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. But Lord, the lady replied, even the dogs under the table eat the, eat the children's crumbs. Then Jesus told her, For such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. 
The lady went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Verse 31. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After Jesus took him aside, away from the crowd, he put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's, the man's tongue. He looked up to the heavens, and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephpatha, which means be opened. At this time the man's ears were open, and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more people kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Alright, so that's chapter 7. I also noticed that there's a delay in the visual. Let me know if it becomes a problem when it comes to uh, like mashing the visual and the audio. Let me just try and fix it once and then we'll see if it, uh, if it does anything. Okay. Okay, let's see if that let's see if this sticks. Uh if it doesn't then can't not much can be done about it, but hey, we're not gonna be on that long today anyway. Uh, I think it's just nicer to have these streams be a lot shorter anyway. <clears throat> but anyway, so chapter seven begins with Jesus giving a discourse about cleanliness. And by extension, what actually matters in a person's life. So the story begins with Jesus' disciples doing non-orthodox things. Now, one of the things that's kind of funny to think about is how, let's put it this way. The way that religious classism worked in first century Israel. So, Something that a detail that's often overlooked when it comes to how Jesus picked his disciples. For the most part, he picked people that actually would have been kind of liked in the, I guess, the secular social order. So you think of like fishermen, tax collectors, you know, people with decent paying jobs. But they were part of like the social the the the, the best word is like the the secular world, if, it, if that makes sense. They're not part of the religious world. They're just business people, they're state workers. Of course, once again, part of that whole like um, religious elitism that existed in first century Israel was that state workers were looked down upon because they were viewed as like race traitors. You know, a Jew working with the Romans kind of thing. They would have been viewed as race traitors. And that's how um, a lot of Jewish culture was. I mean, it wasn't just them, but uh, as far as the Bible is concerned, we're talking about them. So <clears throat> the, the Jews would have viewed people like that as like race traitors. And they would have viewed people in the secular work sphere as like less important. Sure, you hold up the fabric of society, but at the same time, it's kind of like, well, you're not, you're not the elite of our culture. You're not, you're not the people that should be respected anyway. Your, your job is the expected job. Uh, hot take of the week, but that's traditionally how um, a lot of modern women view a lot of jobs that men do. It's, the, it's just the, it's expected for you to do it. But they're kind of, there's still that social stigma towards blue collar jobs. You think of like, and not even just blue collar jobs, but like hard boot jobs. So like construction work and whatnot. And those jobs are looked down upon, even though they're like, kind of like important to the infrastructure of the society you live in. 
but they're still looked down upon by you know a lot of social elites and this is where just like in first century israel we still have this collide today it's just not so much religious anymore but it's the same kind of thing and i just i just wanted to make that parallel so that you have some kind of visual equivalency to picture but the way that A lot of a lot of professional uh, women look down upon guys who work like blue collar jobs because oh those you know you're you're not the elite class even though you're kind of essential to society because you know without some guys keeping infrastructure going none of this would be possible <laughs> but that was kind of the view that the the uh, Jewish religious leaders had toward people like fishermen and whatnot because actually a, a, a funny bit of trivia is that fishermen would have been viewed very highly in ancient israel along with like it's the same thing with like most ancient world viewing hunters as being like a high-end job but see like a funny twist in today's world where your social elites act like the religious leaders in in the gospels we look nowadays we, uh, people I shouldn't say we, I, I view hunters with high respect, but like people generally view hunters and like, um, meat shop people as like lower, lower class, but it's, but in the ancient world, these people were viewed as high class because well, back in the ancient world, getting meat wasn't easy. <laughs> you had to, first of all, find an, a big enough animal to kill, to feed a community. Secondly, you had to fight off other people who were going to take that animal. So hunters had to fight each other and hunters had to fight anim other animals like predators. So being a hunter was a tough job. And so in the ancient world, hunters were viewed with very high regard. But somewhere, and part of like the problem of that quote unquote religio culture that first century Israel ran with this problem, a lot of um, during the Middle Ages, and why some people look down on like the Catholic Church, for instance, they had this. The Catholic Church had this attitude for a while, and it, it's not just like a religious thing, right? We see it in the modern world now. Uh, people with certain jobs that were the dirty jobs, if you will, they were dirty but necessary jobs. They were still looked down upon by the social elite. So that's some important context. Why is this context important? Because in order for, so let's say, let's say you're a farmer and for the most part, you're kind of, you, you're aware that people look down on you because you work a dirty job. I mean, you got to deal with animal crap figuratively and literally, uh, you got to deal with, you got to deal with the elements and we all know nature's a bitch. You got to deal with. You got to deal with like high uh, competition when it comes to your particular field because, you know, it's not like you're the only farmer in town. There's a whole bunch of you farmers all trying to survive. And so being a farmer was not a fun job, but it was a necessary job. And it's the kind of job that like it's tons of hard work and nobody gives you thanks for it. And so. Farmers were aware that that was their situation, that was their lot in life. But basically a, a set of systems and Jesus, this is what Jesus is referring to when he talks about like the traditions of men. Eventually in the temple cult culture, that was redundant. In the temple culture or temple cult, basically they came up with a system to be like, okay, uh, if you want to be treated as like with respect by us elite you can still abide by some of the rules of the elite and so one of these which the bible does mention in mark is the ceremonial cleaning so that's an important thing too that when we when you read this passage in chapter 7 and talks about like the disciples not washing themselves uh it's not as simple like you know wash your hands with soap when you go to the bathroom it's not just that 
but in the ancient world, and it's not just Judaism, before someone goes, oh, the Bible and their ridiculous traditions, Judaism is not the only group of people to do this, okay? Uh, every religion does this. Uh, if you actually like study Shintoism and the way that like um, shrine culture is in Japan, I know it's well that I have a lot of Japan on my mind because uh, for other for obvious reasons, but uh, Japan shrine culture is very much the same. There's a lot of cleaning rituals. Buddhist temples for sure do this. Uh, you do not offer incense at a Buddhist temple without properly washing yourself. And so there's like a whole thing where you take the cup thing, you take, you draw water from the cup, a certain amount of water from the cup, you do not overdo it, and you pour it over your hand over a particular place. So, in a in a Buddhist temple, you would start at one, you start, you get, you pick up the the, the water drawing scooper thing, and then you go to the water thing, you pick up the water, you don't wash your hands where you picked up the water because you know you don't contaminate. The water there so you go to this pan this other area which has a bunch of these pans you wash your hands there uh, and then that purifies you before you can burn incense because you don't just walk into a buddhist temple and burn incense that's that's not how that, that that's like a no-no and then in shintoism is very similar they they have their own version of that because they obviously borrowed that from buddhism i was just thinking of like japanese shrine culture you like well, because the funny thing is, like, in anime, you never see that process. And anime is always skips that step. They go straight to the pulling the, uh, the, uh, the prayer bell. They pull the rope for the prayer bell, and then they do the clap twice in battle thing. They always skip the step where they're supposed to wash themselves. <laughs> in anime, it's so lazy. <laughs> but give us the real, te give us the real shrine experience. But, like, in... In reality, there's like a whole washing process you do. So it's not just a Judaism thing. That's, that's kind of my point. It's not just a Judaism thing where they do this washing ritual. And the washing ritual is because everything else you do in the temple is like a sacred act. Even if it seems like, once again, part of, part of religious activity is taking ordinary activities and then spiritualizing them. I mean, even in modern Christianity, we do this. That's the whole thing with, like, the Eucharist. Is that you're taking an ordinary thing, eating and drinking, and then you turn it into, like, a, a religious experience. And add the spiritual dimensions for that. And so in the same way, uh, ceremonial washing was treated this way. It's, it's not just merely washing your hands with soap and then you're good to go. Because hygienically, you're fine. But it was this the ceremony was like a representation of your spiritual cleanliness and once again this is true across the board whatever religion you're talking about they all do it uh because of of that mindset of that belief of you have to be spiritually clean before you present yourself to god that's the that's the short of it and so that's why, like, verse 3 gives this whole explanation about how, well, Pharisees and the Jews don't eat unless they give themselves a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders, yada, yada, yada. And then it even mentions, sorry, verse 4, I, should, I shouldn't yada, yada, yada. Verse 4 mentions that they, when they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash. So there's an interesting contrast there, and the wording is very specific because when it when the Bible refers to like when the people come from the market, it means when you enter, when you exit the secular and then you enter the spiritual. So going back to the whole farmer thing, being a farmer is like secular. It's not a spiritual thing, even though everybody needs it to survive. But farming isn't a spiritual action. You're not uh, being spiritual. So in order to be viewed as one of us, in our very religious culture you have to purify yourself spiritually you have to bring yourself back into the spiritual presence because you've been in the secular all day with your dirty hand jaw <laughs> but jesus points out that like who cares really which was probably a very taboo move and this is where like you always get that arm wrestle of like how much of religion is man-made and how much is like what God intend, what God intended. 
because you know you have this whole ceremonial spiritual aspect and connecting with the spirit world and all that stuff through like ceremonial cleaning and then you have jesus show up and he's he's just like who cares which is not something you would expect god to ever say <laughs> you don't ever expect god to ever say who cares because that's kind of that would sound antithetical to the you know idea of god that god we, we, we betray jesus as the god who cares so for him to say well who cares about things like ceremonial washing would be like huh and that's probably a big reason why a lot of the jews didn't buy that jesus was who he said he was that if jesus was making any claims that he was god well a lot of people wouldn't buy that because a lot of times jesus is doing this whole like well who cares about that there are, but that's because from Jesus' perspective, it's more about, there are things more important, which Jesus later explains to his disciples. But it's it's kind of funny that Jesus gives these, uh, he gives these kind of illustrate, or not illustrations, but that's the way Jesus', is at, Jesus attitude is portrayed by Mark. Is that Jesus has this very nonchalant, like, what you guys fuss about, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> And once again, to that would have been a, like a big shocker for the Pharisees because, of course, the Pharisees would have used their legalism to lord over the people like, we are better than you. You know, the social elite, the patricians, if you will, are better than the plebs. And so for Jesus to basically say like, well, who gives a shit about any of that is basically breaking down that social class, that social divide between uh, classes. Hey Tom, welcome to the stream. Hope you're having a good day. So that's that was one of the, the one of the things when you read this passage is how Jesus was very politically radical in some senses. Of course, like in in the context of of the book of Mark, the social class is the social classes is like religious and secular. In 21st century, you know, North America or anywhere else for most of that matter uh, we don't view it quite that way it's not like the religious are the elite and the um, uh, the religious like we don't just view it as the religious as the elite and the non-religious as like the lower class it's a little different well especially in North America is very different um, I was actually having a, I was actually doing a bit of research for um, my d4d one of my d4dj videos coming in the future and I was wondering about, like, I wonder if Japan is different about that. Because in America, and by extension Canada where I live, religious jobs are viewed as, like, low-tier jobs. So, like, me being a pastor. Well, I'm not professionally one. Uh, that's why this channel exists. <laughs> but, uh, like, being a pastor, it would be viewed as, like, a low-tier job in North America. But I was I was doing some research uh, for D four DJ videos, and I was like, so one of the running jokes in not just D four DJ but in a lot of animes is that a lot of characters are like pretty wealthy in anime, and the reason for that is because the simple reason for writing char your characters in an anime to be like in the higher economic stratum is simply to avoid like money being a problem when you're writing a story like it's kind of hard to make your typical beach anime episode when half the characters can't afford to go to the beach because they're all broke <laughs> like that doesn't really work right so, so you just write everybody to be kind of rich and so in, in d4dj there's a few characters ray being one of them uh ray's family in d4dj is I didn't. I, I only referenced a little bit in that Ray video, which you should definitely check out. We have a playlist. <laughs> but uh, Ray's family, they're like, they work in like tea ceremony. And that's like a whole Japanese culture thing. So it's, if you were to categorize its place in the um, econom economic stratum, it's a culture, it's a cultural profession, if that makes sense. Which is weird to think about because Ray is also depicted as being like super rich. Like, in the rich girl tears, she's somewhere between really rich and really, really rich girl in D4DJ. Which seems kind of weird. 
because if you look at Ray's parents' jobs, they're cultural jobs. They're not, um, they're not like science scientists or like engineers or anything like that. So it made me scratch my head about like, oh, is it our religious-based jobs and cult culture and religion-based jobs in Japan paid better uh, as they are in North America? That was just a just a curiosity question. Um, if there is someone who's like super affluent in Japanese culture that knows the real answer to that, um, I am welcome to that. It would it would definitely help me in my research as well. But uh, anyway, back to back to the Book of Mark. When verse four mentions that, like when people leave the marketplace, it's viewed as like that other space, the secular space, and so the way that job economic like. Uh, social status was viewed through your profession. And how, like, to, I guess, like, lord over that the, the, the average person was lesser than the religi the religious class. And that's why we have the ceremonial washing ideas. Once again, not exclusively a Jewish problem. This is a across every culture problem. And the reason why I have to really hammer this in is because, like, I want to move away from the idea of, like, we're not talking about hygiene in these passages when we talk about, like, the, the washing things. So, another part of the Gospels to read about something interesting when it comes to, like, ceremonial washing is coming back again to the water-to-wine story. So, Jesus does something very taboo in that story. He has the people there use the washing, um, the washing basins, uh, six washing basins actually. To and then he tells them to pour water in it, and then uh, he turns the water into wine in that story, which is interesting in that story because he, the the six basins that Jesus, that is referred to in John two, are ceremonial washing basins, which is. Def, like the idea of anything other than water being in it would have been like a ludicrous idea. And so for this amazing wine to come out of it was just like the most radical thing. Like, especially to a reader at that time would have thought like, oh, you know, like how taboo Jesus was by doing this. Because once again, that would have been a big no-no. Big no-no. You don't mess around with the ceremonial cleaning stuff. Because that's a very part of the social status of the religious culture of first century Israel. And so, Mark coming back to Mark chapter 7, the interesting contrast is that we get Jesus' attitude toward that. That idea, the social status thing and wash, ceremonial washing. And that Jesus really doesn't care that much. He really doesn't. This is where we get to the discourse that Jesus gives, uh, starting from verse 17. So in verse 17, Jesus has this whole, like, let me tell you what I care about. What I care about is who you are on the inside. Because things you believe... Oh, so you've probably heard the old saying, um, your beliefs determine your behaviors and your behaviors uh why is the rest of it slipping is like your beliefs determine your behavior and your behavior determines something else basically like your your personality and your actions and so jesus makes the point about like well it's who you are on the inside your beliefs and stuff like that right? well, it is those things that determine whether you're clean or not not like, oh, you have dirty hands and you eat with your filthy hands. But it is who you are as a person, the way you act, the way you, uh, the way you live. And so, you know, that's, that's fundamentally what Christianity is at least supposed to be about before people get all like, well, there's a lot of Christians who care about the exterior as well. And of course, this is a common theme throughout even the Old Testament, that God cares more about a person's um, inner character and so 
the famous example is in 1 Samuel 17. Yes, in 1 Samuel 17. Or was it 16? Actually, I think it's uh, 1 Samuel 16, because it's before David, David Goliath is 17. Before that, uh, when the prophet Samuel has to anoint the new, the future king after Saul, because God got super mad at Saul. So there's going to be a new king instead of Saul. And so when Samuel, the prophet, is looking through this guy's family, and Samuel sees the first, the first guy, and Samuel's like, Oh, sorry. You got some running water in the background. That has most of the water sound gone on. Continue. So in First Samuel, uh, sixteen, when Samuel has to like pick through like a bunch of sons from a guy named Jesse to be who's the next king, and Samuel sees the first guy and he's like, "Oh yes, this guy here. He's gonna like he definitely looks like the makings of a future king." And then God's like, "No, I've not chosen him because I don't. I'm. I don't look at people's appearances. I look at their hearts." That's the TLDR of 16.9. Uh, and so God's like more interested in a person's inner being. And so <clears throat> coming back to Mark chapter 7 again, that's what Jesus points out to his disciples. That's what's important. It's who you are as a person and um, your inner character. And so Jesus talks about like, well, think about the things that like can come out of a person's mouth when they speak things like lies um slander uh lewdness and things like that and think about like a person's actions like sexual immorality uh greed uh malice and all that like those are the thing like when those things come out of a person that's how you know they're a bad person basically and so Jesus says, that's more important. That's what I care about. And so now I'm going to backpedal a little bit and go earlier in chapter, uh, chapter 7, where Jesus gives some examples of this. So Jesus is calling out these Pharisees and he's saying, like, look at you and your human traditions. You claim that you your, your ways are the right ways of living. And then he uses one of the Ten Commandments, and actually a pretty high tier one. Um, honor your father and mother is... Uh, commandment number five which means it's pretty high tier because there's five commandments of the ten that are below it and thus to some extent are less important in the tiering sense uh, because there is a tier system within the ten commandments but to honor your parents is pretty high in that tier and there's an my logic of why the bible may have written it that way is partly because of like the way you relate to your parents is directly correlated to how you relate to God. So it's very, very important um, that you honor your father and mother. So when Jesus is calling out the Pharisees of like, you, when you say that you don't honor your father and mother and claim that like you're doing something that you should do for them as like, it's for God, and then you abandon your parents, well, you're violating the Ten, you're violating the Ten Commandments. And so that's, that's worse. <laughs> so like that was... That Jesus calls them out for that because what Jesus is pointing at is that in their heart, people care. Like he's saying that, like okay, Jesus. Be, okay, let me let me let me reword that. So Jesus is effectively saying, it's not about listening to God that matter to you. It's looking like you care about God more than other people, and you want people to think you think that. 
And that's what's important to you. That's why you're even willing to throw your parents under the bus. Just so you look religious. Like, that's an that's such an asshole thing to do. Is what Jesus is basically calling out on. Uh, Chris says, If Jesus didn't really care about ceremonial practices, then why did he command ceremonial practices in the Torah? Uh, if you're un Okay, so, that's a good question. So, there's a difference between ceremonial practices, like the Pharisees are portraying, in mark and you may have missed the earlier part of the stream just now but i was explaining how like there's also the intent which jesus is talking about like the whole like what comes out of a person defiles them discourse so when it comes to things like touching dead carcasses um emissions and leprosy okay there's three things we have to consider number one hygiene was very different between first century israel and 1200 BC Israel, or not even Israel, 1200 BC walking in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so there's huge differences of hygiene. So in the Torah's case, a lot of those were hygiene purposes. And so the equivalent today is, remember when, remember when people got like super serious about like how to wash your hands because of COVID? So like, if, if, if you were still working during COVID, some of us had to do those essential jobs. But like, oh, so it looks so freaking stupid when you look at it in hindsight. So if you go to the bathroom at work during COVID and then like over the freaking sink, you don't even see your own reflection in the mirror because the mirror is plastered with those stupid like how to wash your hands posters. And it's like, first you rinse your hands and then you take soap and you scrub your hands with soap for 25 to 25 to 50 seconds. You lather and then the picture just shows you're wasting water for the whole time because the picture shows a picture of a guy's hands and the water's still running, but his hands is not in the water. <laughs> so like you wash and lather your hands for 25 seconds to 50 seconds, you, you know, lather it in. Then you rinse, you, you wash off, you rinse off that soap with the the water you put your hand back in and you wash for another like 30 seconds and then you take the paper towel you dry your hands and you use the paper towel you just use to turn off the water faucet like that's basically a ceremonial cleaning during the covid thing whereas like how's the average person wash your hands water on take soap scrub your hands for a few seconds hands in, hands in uh hands with soap and water Scrub for another like five to ten seconds to get all the soap off. Turn off water. Take paper towel. Dry your hands. You're done, right? Like, no one actually like if you're one of those people that actually followed like that instruction sheet to the letter. That's hardcore because the bulk of us don't do that. I mean, who the hell has time to spend two minutes washing their hands? Honestly, I got so many other things to do. For starters, at your workplace, they get pissed off. You take too long in the washroom, which seems almost counterintuitive if you think about it, right? But anyway, <laughs> let's reel back to ancient world now. So even though I call first century Israel also ancient world, it kind of is. But in comparison, there's like ancient world and then there's like really, really ancient world. So the Torah, which is roughly 1200, 1200 BC, that's like really, really ancient world. And that's very different because, okay, like... There's a, difference, there's a difference between washing your hands before you eat and wash your hands if you had to deal with a dead body. Those are two completely different things. Okay. So there's that as well. So um, those are not like... That's like small app. That's like an app. You're comparing an apple slice to a whole apple. <laughs> like, yeah, there, 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 there are similarities of like ceremonial washing between the two. But at the same time, the reasons why you would have really needed a ceremonial wash are completely different. Because wash your hands before you eat. Like, there's a bit of hygiene, true. But it it's not the biggest deal if, like, you know, you're eating some chips and then you grab the pop can with the same hand you were eating chips with. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> Whereas, like, it, was re it would have been really unsafe, especially because modern medicine didn't exist back then thank god for modern medicine but you know 
you could get serious sickness if you touch something that was pretty dirty and then you you know were spreading germs and stuff like that around there there weren't the cures for that back then so that's the main reason why okay in the torah they made a big deal about like ceremonial washing because the context was you're dealing with a whole bunch of people walking around in the middle of nowhere and how to not spread diseases in a nomadic tribe so ceremonial cleaning was taken way more seriously whereas like first century israel like civilization is generally pretty good minus the whole roman oppression thing but for the most part things are pretty good so uh ceremonial washing was a very different attitude and once again as i mentioned earlier a lot of it was like see in the in the in the in the torah you can easily just make like clear physical equivalency whereas the 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 cleaning ceremony as presented in mark it's it's more of this like spiritual cleaning and it's more like the spiritual cleansing is used as justification of classism and as i was pointing out just earlier it's not just a jewish thing every culture does this and i made the the parallel of like a buddhist temple you go to a buddhist temple and uh, you have to do ceremonious cleaning there even though like even if you wash your hands before you left the house and you go to the buddhist temple you're not allowed to do like any of the ritual stuff without doing the ceremonial cleaning because it's less to do about like actual hygiene and more about like the ritual if you will now of course there were obviously there were some ritualized aspects of like what the torah gets at where like okay let's say you had to do like you you had to deal with someone with leprosy and then you wash yourself but you still have to like not go around touching stuff for like the next four days or something like that because once again when you're dealing with a bunch of traveling nomads without modern medicine you don't want to take any chances <clears throat> it's the whole thing with like coming back to the 21st century we ran into this with the covid thing oh if you feel like you have symptoms of covid you don't go out for two weeks which is a pretty long time i mean if you think about it covid was more strict than the bible if you think about it that way <clears throat> and i mean that's not just like that's a super huge hygiene thing you touch any dead carcass i mean i remember when i was uh interning at a church <laughs> and uh me being like okay you want to obviously be safe when you're like cleaning uh dead animals that like th those are like okay so when i was in this one church uh we found like a huge ass like dead bird and a dead rat so there i guess like the bird must have like died of something while flying and then it fell and then the rat it was carrying also fell to its death and so we had a dead crow and a dead rat just lying in like the church parking lot and so being the intern <laughs> my job part of my job was to go clean it up right you think i'm gonna touch that shit with my hands hell no so like you know you got like i took like the, a shovel that we had normally used for like uh clearing dirt and stuff like that and I, I took a shovel and then i like scooped up the the, the dead animals into like uh and scuba and then throw into like the the, the giant compost so that they could be sent back to nature. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, getting rid of that. And I was like, yeah, I'm not serving communion today. <laughs> I'm not going to be the one who does that. Because I, even though I used a shovel, I had to deal with two dead animals before church. I am not, do I am not doing communion. And you definitely would not want to touch that stuff if you knew I was even remotely close to two rotting animals in a parking lot so like the whole dead carcasses thing is kind of like you know it goes without saying of like why you really needed some strict uh cleaning rituals when it comes to if you ever had to deal with a dead animal or any dead thing for that matter so not exactly the same
<clears throat> and I mean, th there's also other like things when it comes to like ceremonial ha and like okay, touching dead animals is another thing too. Um, you think of like in ancient China and like stories of like drum makers. It goes back to the whole like you're doing an essential job because music is a part of your culture. So drums are an essential part of that culture. But yet the people who made drums were looked down upon because they had to touch a dead animal, you know, because you got to skin the thing, get the leather so that you can use it to make the, uh, the, um, why am I forgetting the technical term? The, the part you hit on a drum, uh, you use the, a dead animal skin to make that. So what you did is an essential service, but at the same time, you're still looked down upon because you had to touch a dead animal. Like, how is that fair in society? <laughs> See, modern modern society, we don't look at it quite that way. And that's why, like, once again, ceremonial cleaning isn't viewed the same way as it is now. Uh, save for the COVID thing. The COVID thing kind of brought that back. But for the most part, uh, a lot of cleaning, ceremonial cleaning was for hygiene. Uh, in the Old Testament, especially in the Torah, it was used for hygiene because... Traveling nomads, you don't want to take chances. But this is where what Jesus gets on about in Mark 7, because I got to come back to it uh, at some point. Jesus talks about like, well, you, you're you taking, you're taking like simple commands God gave, and then you're like, oh, you're making overblown rituals out of them with your human, that's what he calls like the human traditions. You're making overblown rituals out of them. And that, def and that ends up defeating the whole purpose. So going back to verse 9 of chapter 7, Jesus uses the parallel of you think you're being honorable because you're like doing something for God, but you, you violate one of the Ten Commandments to do that. So the whole not honoring your father and mother thing. But you say, well, in instead of giving money to my parents to help them in their old age, uh, this money goes to, like, the temple because it's for God. It's like, no, you're supposed to... You, as their child, is supposed to take care of them when they're old because they can't do it themselves anymore. Like... Why, like, you, you may claim to do that because you want to view... You want to be viewed as more spiritual. But... In a way, you've also done something really really bad to make yourself look good and jesus was like that's not good you can't be doing that and so that's why like you hear a lot of christians now uh think this way you didn't hear this so much in the 90s where like i think a lot of people didn't quite grasp this as well but that's why like you hear this rhetoric about how uh, my fan like you hear some Christians say my family is my ministry if, I may, if you ever heard that for, uh, phrasing and basically the idea of like there's nothing wrong with just like being good parents for instance is a more powerful ministry than like the streaming parson channel okay. so being a good parent is super important being a good being good with like your everyday things like being a good being a good co-worker is what god expects instead of like you know making a fancy youtube channel to promote the gospel not that you know like there are things that the even in the everyday things you're you're supposed to be honoring god in that and that because that reflects who you are inside and this goes to the later part of the discourse, coming back to verse 17. Jesus says, well, it is the stuff inside of you that comes out. And that's what really defiles a person. So if you have bad character, you're not nice to the people around you. That's because of your moral failing. That is a bigger deal than ceremonial washing. Because... The point I was originally going to point out before I got sidetracked by your question, Chris. The point I was going to point out was it's one thing to be like you don't want to be deceived by people who look religious in the way that they uh, 
they present themselves in public and the way that they do certain ritualized acts. You care more about like what they're what they're like when how the old saying goes, integrity integrity is who you are behind closed doors. And that's why like the modern equivalency would be like why we crap on politicians so much. And the main reason why we crap on them so much is because a lot of politicians, they, they talk the big game about helping people and being a social servant. But then behind closed doors, they're like such assholes. And like, you think of like, once again, American politicians, easy punching bags for this illustration, the equivalency of the religious leaders in Jesus' time. Like how many, how many uh, senators and whatnot, they have like sex scandals and not being good people because they pay for prostitutes and stuff like that. So you can't have people talk about like, we got to fix the human trafficking problem, but then like they pay for prostitutes. Uh, Technic, you know, a lot of the, the super edgy stuff in like the gamer community, gamer communities, I should say. How many like people in, like, for example, the Smash Brothers community was a easy punching bag where like, how many of them were like kitty diddlers? Oh, protect children and then have these guys are kitty diddlers. So like, who cares about the stuff, the, the politics you parrot? But who are you really underneath that? And this is also like the, the quintessential example. Man, today's just full of hot takes. I mean, you want to have a good Friday today, don't you? So you want to hear some streaming parts and hot takes. But uh, the whole male feminist discourse. So why male feminist, male feminist, which is a massive load of bullshitters, is because a lot of them end up being sexual predators. So how can you have a male feminist be like women's rights, women's rights, and then they're also like the most predatory people? So it's who cares about the, the politics you, you speak out of your mouth? It's all about who you are as a person. And that's why Jesus didn't care about the ceremonial washing. Because, yeah, you can make yourself look good. You can make yourself look like the... Um, the You can make yourself look like you're the better person compared to the, you know, the low-class people over there, the people who work your McDonald's jobs or whatever. You can make yourself look better than them, but... Are you really better than them? Like, like in reality, I mean, this sounds kind of like a duh, but you would rather trust, you know, the average person that just works a McDonald's job, but he's like a pretty reasonable guy. He doesn't commit crime. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't abuse women. He doesn't do, you know, he doesn't do any of that stuff, but he's just a McDonald's worker. But you would trust that guy with your life Compared to like, you know, the guy with the snazzy suit, nice car, but diddles kids. You would trust a McDonald's work. You would trust a McDonald's worker with your life, but you wouldn't trust the other guy. With anything, let alone your kids. <laughs> so, I read some feminist women are like that. Simone de Be Simone de Beauvoir had relations with young girls. The irony. Well, there, there's that whole discourse, right? And that's why, you know, feminism is just a little crock. It's like, just read the pe like the source of your studies. People like Simone de Beauvoir. Awful people. And then who was the other guy? Um, the other person with the whole, like, uh, gender as a social construct. That that person. Um, that, that, she, uh, he was the guy that, uh, he took like a pair of twins and like sexually abused them to no end. <laughs> and so like, yeah, not good people because once again, it's, it's, it's less about like the ideas you, the ideas you might have. It's more about who you are as a person. And so that's the other thing too. And see in a, in a, in a, in a healthy liberal society, Jim money. Yeah. Or John money. Yeah. I think it's John money. You're probably right. Uh, his name just slipped, he, his name just slipped my mind earlier, but oh, crap. I, I was gonna use another example. Oh yeah, so the other example 
It's a shame we missed him on Thursday. But uh, my buddy's Shining Light. So Shining and I, in reality, we actually disagree a lot on politics. We're very different people now. But the reason why him and I are friends is because of who we are as people. The way that we that we treat people, the way that we, um, the way that we act toward people, the way that, um, the way that we treat each other, the way that we speak to others, the way that we show love to the people in our lives. Shiny and I are very similar in that way, and it's more about who we are as people and how we interact with people. Our political beliefs don't really matter that much, and so. Even though Shining and I are very, very different people in that ritual, in that respect, uh, the things that are important, like who we are on the inside, and the way that we treat others, that's more important, and that's why we're friends. Because you could look at Shining and I, when like for instance we have like a political debate, we haven't done it on the Streaming Parson channel very often, but we used to do it on my buddy Tosi Alir's channel quite a bit. We would have like political discussions and Shining and I disagree on quite a number of things. But it's th those things are less important. The, the 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 ritualized performances, if you will, between Shining and myself, that is not relevant. Or it's not, not it's not that it's not relevant, but they're not that important in the grand scheme of things compared to who we are as people and how we treat each other as people. That's more important. So, in the same vein, when Jesus talks about what really defiles a person is the stuff that comes out of you. So, things like how you treat others, how you speak to others. Those things are more important. How you show love to people in your life. Those are more important. That's what Jesus cares more about. Because that's, that's more of a portrayal of who you really are. But if the thing, and as Jesus warns his disciples, if those things inside of you are bad, that is what defiles you. Because then then those things will come out. If you're a person who's uh, greedy, then that will come out through your actions. And that makes a bad person. Jesus is more concerned about who you are on the inside. So that's the discourse of why Jesus didn't care so much about the ceremonial washing in the physical sense. Because, once again, you can easily use that as a charade anyway to hide being a bad person. Going back to people like John Money and Simone de Beauvoir as good examples. That. So what if your ideas are relatively good? If, if you can even say that. Because, once again, their ideas end up being destructive, as we have seen in the 21st century. But it's the whole like real communism argument. The whole real communism has been tried argument. <laughs> it's like, hello, communism has killed more people in 100 years than Christianity and Islam put together in their entire histories. Think about that for a minute. With, like, okay, religion obviously has problems, but what's worse, right? <laughs> And once again, like, you know, a lot of people say, like, well, Islam's horrible because it's killed a lot of people. And, I mean, that's not untrue. But at the same time, it's like, okay, communism is clearly way worse. <laughs> it's killed way more people in way less time. <laughs> so think about that for a minute. Because uh, according to studies, I think Islam's kill count is like, I don't know. 50 million people over a course of like 1300 years which is a lot of people that's that's still 50 million people but communist china alone already matched that number in like 60 years so think about that and that's one communist country so and that's why we like we talk about like how mao was so evil in history like under his rule more people died under his rule than the entirety of how many people Islam's killed. <laughs> Which is a lot of people. <laughs> so, there's a case in point of like, people promoting communism really don't know what they're talking about unless they're honest about the fact that they want to commit genocide. 
<laughs> Just a thought. But anyway, we're sidetracked. So, but that's because I've also finished the whole discourse on like the first half of chapter seven. So let's move on to something a little bit more lighthearted. <laughs> so in verse 24, we get a story about Jesus doing like missions work in a Greek town. So the Decapolis, which the Bible does reference from time to time, and Jesus goes there from time to time. So it would have been a part in like, so if you, remember, if you guys remember, Jesus does a lot of his ministry in the northern province of Israel. Uh, his home, his his base of operation is in Capernaum, which is uh, Peter's hometown. And then from there, he kind of like, essentially his ministry is him walking around in circles in that area. So he stays relatively close to Capernaum for the bulk of his ministry. And then he circles around, like he goes to the surrounding areas of Capernaum. Well, one of those surrounding towns, a, a surrounding city if you will so think of it this way Capernaum is the town is a town I'm trying to think of like um, a US equivalent um, why am I why am I brain friend I'm trying to think of like a good US equivalent so like if let's say Capernaum is like uh, Okay, so in Los Angeles is the 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 you have a see San Francisco is not the best example because San Francisco is a major city. But let's just pretend Capernaum is San Francisco for a second. And near San Francisco there's the Santa region. So the Santa region is like Santa Barbara, uh Santa all the Saint whatever places in southern los uh, southern california and san francisco is kind of like close to it but they're, they're two different places but the santa town cities they're all like a bunch of mini cities now put together all the santas are bigger than san francisco but individually they're just like their own little their own mini cities and santa barbara being one of them and so Imagine that the base of operation Capernaum is San Francisco and then there's a bunch of there's this area and the Bible refers to it as the Decapolis because they're like 10 cities. So that's the Santos region, the Santos region in Southern California, where they have a bunch of smaller cities called Santa something. That's why it's called the, the Santa region. And so one of the places if jesus was walking around san francisco for instance he would end up in santa barbara and these places from time to time and the reason why i use that the american parallel is because san um san francisco is supposedly like very american if you will and then the santa regions are more like um mexican if you will because they have a lot of like Mexican immigrants. So there would have been two different ethnic groups that if you go between San Francisco and the Santa regions. Of course, that's kind of blurred in more recent times. The last couple of decades actually has been blurred. But that's kind of the equivalent that Jesus was doing between going from Capernaum and then he would go to the Decapolis. Hey, uh, Mike Harrell, welcome to the stream. So that that's kind of the parallel, the the equivalent I have. So Jesus would frequently go to this place called the Decapolis, and Tyre and Sidon are two places in that Decapolis, and of course because it's not part of the more Jewish uh, area of Capernaum, well even Capernaum is not that Jewish, but the Decapolis for sure would have been very very Greek or non-Jewish because it's not just Greek, but you know what I mean. <laughs> not jewish so jesus would have gone to this place quite a bit because it was close by at least close enough and so with that said jesus would have gone to this place and when he does miracles and stuff like that of course he's going to run into non-jewish people 
So verse 24 starts with the story of a Syrophoenician. Uh, one of the many people, like, I guess you could say, like, I know it sounds terrible to word it this way, but, like, it's one of the colonized indigenous groups, if you will, of, like, northern Israel that, like, over and over, these uh, Syro-Phoenician people would have been, like, they were the indigenous people of Canaan once upon a time, and then when Israel came in, they got colonized by them. And then when the Babylonians conquered Israel, and by extension, the indigenous people that were living there as well, that they got colonized, and then it happened again with the Greeks, and then again with the Romans. <laughs> and so the Syrophoenicians are like, they're still in their quote-unquote ancestral land, but it, it, it since the, the land itself keeps changing hands, they just get shuffled around. They, they get shuffled around a little bit, but they're still on their ancestral lands. And so they're like, oh, we are our people, but we've been subjugated by like five other people groups at this point. <laughs> so that's the Syrophoenician in a nutshell. And they're, and then of course, as history passes on, they probably like whatever other people groups are in the Middle East among the many, because you don't just call them all Middle Eastern. <laughs> They have like their own little uh, groups within that. Uh, the Syrophoenicians at some point would have blended into one of those groups. It's just how it is. That's how history is. But anyway, the point of the pointing out that she's a Syrophoenician is that she's not Jewish. And so I know this story gets like quite a bit of like talk about it. So I guess we got to give our, I'm going to give my take on it. I have given a more thorough take on it in my Luke reading. So go check my Luke playlist for the more thorough reading of the Syrophoenician woman. I'm going to give a quick uh, rundown of it. So basically, uh, this woman goes up to Jesus and she's like, Hey, I know you have the power to drive out demons. I have a daughter. She's demon possessed. And I really need you to deal with this problem for me. And then Jesus says, well... I'm here for the children of Israel. Well, that's how he words it in the Luke account. He goes, well, I'm here for the children of Israel. Uh, is it right for me to throw their food to the dogs? And so it's interesting that Jesus uses this kind of terminology because people think like Jesus being mean, but he's, he's playing into both Jewish and Syrophoenician culture. So in a way, Jesus is being extremely inclusive uh, by using this discourse, which is ironic. Because it sounds like he's being discriminatory by referring to her as a dog and his fellow Israelites as the children as the children. But at the same time, he's he's playing along with her Syrophoenician worldview. And I have to explain a little bit of what that is. So in a in a place like the Decapolis, there would have been tons of different people groups. As I mentioned before, it's like ten Greek cities. That's what Decapolis basically means. 10 cities <laughs> and the word decapolis is a greek word so that's my translation of logic for you so <clears throat> there would have been all kinds of different cultures living in the decapolis you have 10 cities you have at least 10 cultures kind of makes sense so uh anyway the syrophoenician woman she probably is just part of the pluralism of that culture if that makes sense. And that's kind of how you would view like Greater Vancouver where I live. So Greater Vancouver is a set of like a bunch of small cities, if you will. But we just call it Greater Vancouver because everyone would call themselves like a Vancouverite to some extent. But anyway, uh, this, this woman, she would have, she lived in a very pluralistic culture in a pluralistic city within that culture. So it would have been pretty normal for her. Now, of course, I am assuming a little bit here. But only a crazy person would not assume this. And that is, basically, if this had been a thing for a while, she would have already gone to all the different diviners that were around. Whatever religion, whatever people group, doesn't really matter. The fact is, she would have been to, like, other healers and stuff like that. To try and get help. Hey, uh, Kimoko. Welcome to the stream. Hello. Uh, 
Uh, so it's kind of implied that like she goes up to Jesus and she's like, "You're my, you're my last hope. I've been to so many places. I've seen so many people. Nobody can help me. Uh, can you help me?" And so Jesus goes, "Well, look, I'm not even your first option." So why should I view you like my first option? You know, the whole Jesus being coy thing like he does a lot in the book of Mark. Back with the whole like not caring about the ceremonial cleaning thing. Jesus kind of plays like a more, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so Jesus is like, yeah, okay. Like what makes, what makes me, what makes you think I'm different? I mean, I'm part of a people group that you probably view as like lesser than you. I'm from the little backwater town of Cap I'm I'm my base of operations is in the little backwater town called Capernaum. So why do you cities why would someone like you who lives in a city with all your options? Why would you think that I'm someone worth seeing? That's effectively what Jesus is saying when he refers to like the whole children and dogs thing. Because her culture would have viewed it the other way, if that makes sense. So the Decapolis, they're the children, and the outsider is the dog. So Jesus plays along with this a little bit by playing with like, okay, we're I view my own people as the children and you guys as the dogs. Just like you have been doing for us for oh I don't know, forever. As long as for as long as we've colonized you basically. <laughs> so why 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 should I play along with this? Is what Jesus is he's effectively asking her. But what's interesting is what the woman does is she doesn't appeal to religion. She doesn't say, well, you're Jew, you Jews believe in a God that's for all nations. She doesn't make that appeal. She doesn't appeal to, oh, well, your God is supposed to be like super nice. She doesn't make that appeal. Instead, what she does here is she appeals to his humanity. So when she says, Lord, she replies, even the dogs underneath the table eat the children's crumbs she's appealing to his humanity because it's like look like no one is so heartless to just abandon those in need so even a hungry dog can get crumbs so the woman appeals to his humanity in the luke version in the luke version she addresses him as lord right away in here it's not so much Because the, the Bible doesn't even give her the Bible does so I had to reread it again in Mark. In Mark, her first statement is not given. It just the Bible just says that she begged Jesus to free her daughter of demon possession. And then the dialogue actually begins with Jesus talking. In the Luke version, it's different. In the Luke version, the Syrophoenician woman talks first, and she addresses him as Lord right away. And so in the Luke in the Luke discourse, I talked about how um She's making a religious appeal at first. If you really are who you say you are as the Jewish Messiah, you can make my daughter well, is effectively what she says in the Luke version. But that line is skipped in the Mark version because it doesn't really matter. Uh, whereas in the, in the, in the Luke account, it, it does make that interesting appeal of the humanity of the humanity of God. And that's why with this whole, in, in Mark, the dialogue is still kept where she says, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the children's table is she appeals to Jesus's humanity. Because in, in the Luke version, her first sentence, she appeals to the divine nature of Jesus. And Jesus kind of plays the game with her a little bit. Saying like, well, am I not just one of many gods in your eyes? Whereas here, Jesus starts off with that. Am I not just one of the many gods in your eyes? But then the woman appeals to his humanity. And then Jesus in his humanity goes, Okay. I'll, I, I'm willing to help her. Because of our humanity. Of, because of, of our humanity. And that's a discourse a lot of people actually forget about this story. I think too many people focus on the words themselves. Because I know like people have made the whole controversy that like Jesus is being flat out mean by referring to her as a dog. 
But that's not true at all. Um, Jesus is just... Jesus is simply questioning her on why she would even go to a Jew. And that is like... I guess a modern equivalent would be like... Okay, in our modern culture, in our very pluralistic culture, why would we like say, okay, um, for a long time you can believe in whatever um, belief you have, but then all of a sudden you're like, well, can you pray to your God for my help? It's like, well, why can't you pray to your own gods? <laughs> would be the response. If you, if, if, if let's say, let's say someone asked you, they're like, oh, can you pray to your God for this prayer request I have? And you could coyly respond with, well, you have your gods. Why don't you pray to them? That's effectively what the whole children and dogs thing actually refers to. <clears throat> but what's more important in the story is the appeal to Jesus' humanity, which is what restores the girl's daughter. And that's something that, like, if you were to apply it for what does that mean to Christians today, I think that's something that we tend to forget is that the reason why we can trust in Jesus and pray to him with our needs is because when Jesus dwelt among us as a man, he was willing to see how we as people suffer and even entered into that suffering through death on a cross. Jesus was willing to go to the extremes of that suffering. And so when we pray to Jesus, we often appeal to his humanity, whether we um, are consciously aware of this, that is something we constantly do, is that we appeal to the humanity of, of, of Jesus. And that's something that Jesus does answer. <clears throat> and that's, that's, that's comforting. That's, that's where we can take comfort in our prayers. Is that Jesus, like, appeal, by appealing to his humanity, he also understands our humanity. Finally, chapter 7 has the deaf and the mute man. That's like a double whammy, being deaf and mute. That's like gotta be like the, one of the shittiest, like, life scenarios to have. You're both deaf, so you can't hear things people talk about it. Unless... Like, remember, this is the ancient world, so it's not like you can just have, like, your phone, and then you, like, tap in a message on your phone and just show them your phone. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> oh, thank God for modern technology, we could do that. But, like, and then, of course, you can't speak either, so, like, your only form of communication is, like, writing stuff down and showing people, like, what you wrote down. But remember, in the in, in first century Israel, and for the bulk of human history, most people didn't know how to read and write. <laughs> so... Uh, you're kind of screwed if you were both deaf and mute <laughs> because there would be no way you would almost have no way of communicating remember sign language didn't exist back then either uh, and, and you know one of the unfortunate things about like the ancient world is that like if you were born with these kind of defects they would just like leave you out for the wolves and <laughs> throw you in the wild and let you get killed by wild animals because you were basically a giant liability to your culture but thank God for modern technology. We have workarounds for stuff like people being deaf and mute. But anyway, we have this guy who's deaf and mute. So big double whammy of disabilities. And then Jesus heals him in like a very weird way. Where like, first he like puts his finger into like the guy's ears. And then how the hell does he, like, get a bit of his spit into the other guy's tongue? Unless you go, like, the weird way, like, maybe Jesus, like, gave him a kiss or something weird like that. But it's kind of funny to picture your head. How the hell did Jesus pull that off? Like, he, he, remember, both of his hands are already being used, plugging the guy's ear. And then he also has to somehow get spit into the other guy's mouth. So... It's just a weird thing to think about. But Jesus was very non-conventional like that. Uh, as you've noticed in a lot of his other miracles. Convention is... Why do things Why do things the, the straightforward way? That's boring. I mean, he's God. He can, he can come up with thousands of different ways of doing one thing. 
with no effort. So why not do something weird like this? I guess it's just how he does things. But uh, he spits and touches the guy's uh, tongue and he looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said, be open. And then the man's ears were open. I assume he took the, his fingers out of the guy's ear uh, first. His ears were opened and his tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. Which just begs the question, how the hell would some... Well, see, this is a weird thing to wonder about too because the Bible doesn't tell us. And you can make a million theories about this basically, but how the hell would the guy be like... He's deaf and he's mute, but then apparently after a healing, he's able to speak normally. See, one of the logical problems you would run into is that if he was born this way, how the hell would he know how to say anything? Because if you're mute your whole life, you don't know how to move your tongue to make certain sounds. Because, you know, your whole life, your tongue moves and it doesn't make a sound. And if the guy's also born deaf, how would he know that? <laughs> how would he know that he was mute? How is someone else supposed to tell him he's mute? <laughs> if he's also deaf. So, there's all those things where, like, I don't know, the story, the funny details like that just kind of make, like, your brain go to, like, 50,000 different uh, theories. Because it is hilarious like that. That he's both deaf and mute. So it's one thing to be like, okay, how can a blind guy know words? Well, he's only blind. He's not deaf. <laughs> how can he know words? He can say, he can imitate sounds by speaking. But if you're deaf and mute, which I, I gotta say, like, it's one of those things that, like, um, it's what's, what's crazy to think about is that, like, if you think about, like, I remember being asked as a kid, if you were, bo if you were, if you were given, if you had to give up a sense, one of your five senses, which one would you give up? Hey, Gauntlets, welcome to the stream. And that's a, that's a tough question, because, of course, having all five senses is awesome. But, one of the things is, like, I think people... When people asked this question, I remember there was a one guy's response. He he responded with, uh, "People oh, people underappreciate the ability to hear." Because, okay, so first of all, the guy's answer was, "I would give up sight." Because, people underappreciate like your sense of hearing, because yet like the smell, taste, and touch, those are vital. If you did not have a sense of touch. You basically screwed your whole life. Because how would you know, like, if you were, like, in danger of getting, like, hypothermia or something? You couldn't feel the fact that you were cold. Or anything like that. Or let's say, like, someone could stab you from the back and you wouldn't feel... If you, if you didn't have a sense of touch, you wouldn't feel it. So someone could just sneak up and slice you and you'd be done. So sense of touch is, like, super important. It's, it's essential to living. If you lived your life without a sense of taste, life would be so miserable. Imagine if, like, no, you couldn't taste any food anymore. Your life would be so miserable. Because, like, people could feel like the crappiest thing and you would never know. But you could never come to appreciate it either. And appreciate, like, all the good things you get to eat in life. Imagine if you could never do that again. Like, that would be such a miserable existence. So... Clearly, like, taste and touch don't go. You would never give up that sense. And then, smell is an interesting one. Because smell is an important survival. Well, similar to touch. It's super important to survival. Because when you smell things, that's how you know, like, certain dangers are, um, lurk. And so, that's why a lot of animals actually trust on their sense of smell a lot more than their sight. Because an animal doesn't, an animal isn't smart enough to see like, okay, there's a, there's a thing there, but I don't know what that thing does. So the, an animal will like sniff at it to see like, is it, is, does it actually possess dangerous qualities? Because like, for instance, like that's the whole joke about like birds being stupid and running into windows. <laughs> because your eyesight can, can be tricked by stuff like that. Now, not to say that eyesight, like once again, eyesight may be. Like, eyesight is a super important sense because you use it all the time. Especially in our modern day and age where we have, like, screens everywhere. And how important sight is. But I remember this guy's response to, if you were to give up one of the five senses, which one would you give up? And he, would, he said sight. 
and a lot of people question, well, why would you not give up hearing? And he's like, no, hearing is an underrated sense. Because think about like all the stuff you hear in life. Like your ability to commu your ability to connect with someone. Of course, number one is touch. And, you know, the whole thing with sex being like the ultimate form of human bonding and communication. Uh, so touch is, once again, touch is the number one. But aside from that, which is very like spe specific and exclusive, for the most part, the way you communicate with people the most is through sound. The stuff you say to each other. And so, um, even though yes, ninety like seventy percent of communication is nonverbal, but at the same time, uh, that still comes through sound. Because a person could give other like audio um, cues without saying a word. And then of course, like music, number one thing. Imagine you never heard music ever again in your life. Your life would be so miserable. And so, just reading this story about this guy who's like born, like who's deaf. The Bible doesn't tell us how he's deaf, but I'm going to assume he's born that way. Either way, being deaf just sucks. Imagine if you, like, imagine if you became like deaf one day, and how much you would have lost. Like that's a, that's the other thing too. That's like super scary for people, um, and people have anxiety about this all the time. Like, what if magically one day I just became deaf, and how sad that would be. Because, like, one, you would never be able to appreciate music ever again. And that's, like, one of the saddest things ever, I think. Because, like, music is, like, that piece of human culture that transcends culture. Or let me, sorry, that was worded badly. I misworded that. Music is the one piece of human communication that transcends language. And it transcends culture. So, like... To lose the ability to listen to music would just, like, destroy people. That would be, like, one of the saddest things ever. If you could never hear again. And same with, like, like taste is similar, right? Like, you can, if you, you can understand a culture through how they make food. And that is expressed through tasting food. So if you could never taste anything again, <laughs> like, your, your existence would be so miserable. And sound is like that, too. So... When you think about like the story about this guy who's like deaf, it's like man, that's rough, and especially in the ancient world where like you're basically a, a liability in your society if you were deaf. But for Jesus to like do something non-conventional to like heal this guy, like plug his ears and spit in the guy's mouth or whatever, <laughs> to like restore this guy so that he could be part of society again. It really goes to show like how much Jesus cared for people and cared more about the people themselves versus like the idea of personhood, if that makes sense. So if you were to sum up chapter seven, so the reason why we have the whole discourse about Jesus and why he doesn't care about ceremonial cleaning that much, it's because Jesus cares more about people themselves versus perception of people and how people view each other. It's more about, you care about the people themselves. So, um, hot, another hot take today. Wow, today we're just loaded with hot takes. But the modern equivalency is how there's something really sad that's happened in, like, the LGBT movement. And the, the sad thing that happened was that, see, back in the 90s where there was, like, gay pride and stuff like that in the 90s. The reason why, like, their protests, in my mind, were more legitimate than the protest, like, the marches are now. Is because, see, back in the 90s, the reason why um, gay pride operated the way that they did was because they were... Their belief was that they were fighting for human rights. For instance, okay, why can't two gay men be married and have the same uh, marriage rights as straight couples? Now, even if I don't agree with your lifestyle, I agree with your logic. So, <laughs> you're a person at the end of the day. And so, as a person, you deserve those kind of rights. To have, like, protection under the law and marriage rights. You deserve that. 
So back then, the there was a real battle to be fought, and it came down to their humanity, which is why people people came around and said, okay, you know what? Yes, these people deserve rights because they're people. They cared about the people. Sure, you may not agree with their ideology. You may not care. You may not agree with their lifestyle. But at the end of the day, you're you're both people, and you both deserve rights. But then something happened in more recent years, probably past twenty tens, and what happened was, apparently, those same people who fought for those equal rights were pushed out of the community, because, well, it wasn't like, the the Pride March wasn't about like. Just people wanting like certain rights, but like the acknowledgement of like our different sexual identities and whatever infinite amount of plethoras you come up with, which is why the thing kept getting longer, like the 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 letters and why everyone jokes about it calling it the alphabet soup. Because before when it was just like LGB, like okay, <laughs> those are just three different uh, sexual orientations that are quote unquote not the norm, but they're still people. <laughs> and then what ended up happening is there was a shift away from LGB the people and into LGB the idea. And so that's why like, okay, in modern days, people make like huge social media um, outrage when like, and this happened in like my city. Where like, okay, they painted some of the crosswalks with like the rainbow flag. And then when people like mark it up because, you know, it's paint on a drive on like a street. People drive over it with their cars. Eventually, tires are going to wear on that paint. That's just how it is. But when, when that started happening, people were like, oh, this is an offense to like... GBT, the idea, but like, see, no actual people were hurt in the, in, you know, the marking of paint on a road, but it became less about the people and more about the idea. And that's why, you know, you run into like things like the purity spi spiral as well, where it's like people that are, okay. Like I have, I have a number of, well, I know a number of people where they're like, they're gay men and they don't support the movement. Because they're like, well, we've been pushed out of the movement. We're not part of it anymore. Because we're just... We don't, like, constantly parrot the quote-unquote politics. We're just guys who like other guys. That's it. <laughs> they're, they're not, like... To, to them, uh, they're not LGBT enough. Even though they're, like, gay men. <laughs> So, but it became less about the people and more about the idea. And so, in the same way as we read in Mark chapter 7, that was something Jesus fought very hard against. Is you don't just give credence, give credence, sorry, to the ideas. You care for people. And that's why Jesus is willing to help a foreigner. And he's able to help a huge societal liability. Because Jesus cared about the people. And in the religious sense, as portrayed in Mark 7, so what if you have like your ceremonial cleaning rituals? If it doesn't actually help anybody, don't bother. Because what you should be doing is you should be trying to help people. And be good to people. Bring Restore people's relationship with God. First and foremost. And then, you know, that's how that, that's the ultimate way of helping people. But you're supposed to help people. And so that's what, you know, Jesus does this over and over throughout the earlier parts of the book of Mark, where if we remember back in, I think it's chapter two, where Jesus helps a guy with, he heals a man with a withered hand. And he says, well, what should we be doing? Should we save life or kill it? Are you about the people or about the idea? Are you, are you for actually leading people to a relationship with God or do you only care about the idea of a relationship with God? And that was something Jesus strongly challenged because even in the world today, we still wrestle with that. Where like people are caught up on the idea 
of being Christian, but not actually, you know, sir, helping the poor, feeding the hungry. Because that, at the end of the day, that's what Jesus only cared about. And if you think about like the fact that today is Good Friday, why did Jesus bother giving himself to death on a cross? It's because he cared about the people, the people that needed to be restored with God, not the idea of not the idea of relationship with God. Not the idea of forgiveness. Even though forgiveness and all that did come in. Um, I mean, those are all the byproducts, if you will. But Jesus paid for our sins. So, because he cared that we had been disconnected from God. That we had been disconnected from the Father. Jesus cared about that. And so that's why he was willing to die on a cross for our sin and sure like forgiveness restoration and all that stuff it came as a byproduct of that but it's ultimately about because jesus loves the people jesus loves us he loves you and he loved you enough to be willing to pay the blood price through death that we all owe because we could never be close to God. We could never be on our own. But because Jesus loves us. As people. Not the idea of love. But Jesus loved you. He loved me. Enough to give his life for that. And that's the, you know, that's, that's what the gospel is ultimately about. That Jesus loves people. And gave his life for people. And so as we read through Mark 7. That's something Jesus was. He was foreshadowing that. That he was. He ultimately cared about the people. Not the idea. And that's where also you solve that philosophical problem. That every smart ass tries to come up with. Where it's like. Well if. If. If, 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 if sin was a problem, why doesn't God just like magically just erase it and make sin not a thing? It's like, because it, that doesn't show he cared for, because it, the philosophical answer to that is because then God isn't really showing that he cared for people. He, he, that would make God look really, really, uh, what's that word I'm thinking of? Um, like narcissistic almost. If God could just erase sin because he felt like it then that would make him narcissistic because it's just like, well, I just got rid of sin for the idea of perfection, the idea of holiness, the idea of love. But that's not real love. If it, if it doesn't cost you anything, then it's not real love. And that's the thing too, when it comes to like love, like even in like on our human terms, if you love anything, you've sacrificed something for it. Even if it seems like something trivial, you've always sacrificed something for it. Uh, I mean, I, I always made the joke when it comes to like me reading manga, but it's like, I love reading manga enough that I make time for it. You always sacrifice something for it because that's what it takes for love. Of course, I know like love of manga is not the same as loving people, but like <laughs> when you love people, you, you, you're willing to sacrifice for that. And that was something that Jesus was, um, that Jesus did. For all of us that he was he he sacrificed well ultimately himself but a bunch of other things along the way because at the end of the day jesus loves people he loves people deeply i think that's something that is lost i think people sometimes because sometimes too many people get caught up on the idea of you know, the big Christianese words as ideas of like redemption and stuff like that. But forgiveness. But what it comes down to is that Jesus, Jesus is about love for the people. That he wants, he wants them to be restored in relationship with God. Because that's what's, that's what's, that's what's important to him. Is our relationship with God. And like, you know, actual people. Not the idea of a relationship with God. It's not just lip service to Him. And that's why 
Jesus goes out of his way to heal people the way he does and and die on a on a criminal's cross the way he does. Because at the end of the day, it's about love for people. Anyway, I think that's it for today. Spending two hours on one chapter in the Bible. I think we've hit a new track record with that. Three times in a row, even. But anyway, with that said, this is going to be the end. Uh, we're done our reading stream for today. Just some housekeeping. So... I don't think that D4DJ video is coming out this weekend. It might have to be pushed till right after. So maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll see. It's just not this weekend. I was hoping to have it out by tomorrow and then just be like, done. But uh, you just got to wait a little bit longer for the D4DJ video. Uh, but that's okay because, I mean, you should celebrate your Easter weekend. So I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Good Friday. And, uh, have a great Easter weekend. I will be back for sure on Monday. So the next time you'll see me is probably Monday. Because uh, I probably won't have that D4DJ video by then. So Monday at 2 o'clock Pacific time, we will be streaming Unicorn Overlord again. Uh, we're going to move to a new section of the game. A new part of the map so that's kind of cool so don't miss out on that and i do have a playlist to get caught up on i need to modify that list actually today uh, after this stream so with that said uh, i will see you guys monday so yes easter monday we are streaming unicorn overlord and i hope you guys will come out come and hang out with that uh with me and shining hopefully he'll be feeling better and uh, yeah with that said happy easter see you guys monday god bless you